Good morning, everybody, and welcome to online worship for the 33rd week of Ordinary Time here at Fivey and Rothy Norman. You'll see behind me on my chair that's become a kind of stage for the online worship um, a couple of interesting glass heads and on them a couple of the hats that I've been making during this period of lockdown. It seemed to me that to raise some money for the church, it would be good to do something sponsored. But when I thought about it, I thought I can, I'm not fit enough to walk up 30 Monroes or even walk 30 miles in a day or something like that. But I did think I could knit 30 hats to celebrate my 30 years in ministry and auction them to try and raise some money for our church that's lost so much money along with everything else this year because of COVID. So these are two of the hats. All of the hats are knitted out of quite special wool. The pink one is the special colour of wool dyed by my friend independent dyer Helen um, in, uh, she lives up near Clachtoll in Sutherland and has a dye shed up there. And every year she does a charity yarn. And this one is called Marsh Orchid and it's dyed to raise money for Marie Curie. So it's a doubly charitable hat, that one. It's all beautiful wool. Um, hers is um, specially dyed. Um, and the one on the other hat head is actually made of Noro, which is my favorite wool that comes from Japan and is hand spun from fleece dyed in those beautiful colours and then spun together in the pattern that they want them to come out in the yarn. So it's very special too. So all the yarns I've used are different. Um, I will put a couple more there every week until I auction them so you get a chance to have a little look. I think that's the plan anyway. However, online worship is not really the place for raising money, just letting you know that's going on too. So we turn to worship. We begin today with Psalm 123. If you would like to read it out along with me, please do so. Lord, I look up to you, up to heaven where you rule. As a servant depends on his master, as a maid depends on her mistress, so we will keep looking to you, O Lord our God, until you have mercy on us. Be merciful to us, Lord, be merciful. We have been treated with so much contempt. We have been mocked too long by the rich and scorned by proud oppressors. Let us pray. Lord our God, we have become used to being free people, people whose choices are vast and whose opportunities are so much wider than our ancestors. We who were servants, are now masters of ourselves and choose to serve. Yet we also grow into faith and hope and love and a choice which is ours to make, to love and to serve you, to follow Jesus Christ and to love and to serve one another, a lifetime of choice to serve. Forgive us, we pray, when our service has not lived up to our intentions when we have forgotten whose we are and whom we serve in the chaos of being ourselves. May we remember every day the path that Jesus Christ took, the path of service and sacrifice that knew, knew no bounds, that held back nothing. In gratitude we bring to you the worship of our hearts and the service of our whole selves, freely given as we have received freely from you. May we find the joy of service and the dignity of service to you as together we ask you to guide us towards the right paths to the new kingdom which you have planned and are building heart by heart throughout time. Lord of all, only you are master of space and time. Only you can command light and terrify the darkness. Only you can show us the path to follow and the service we are asked to give. Open our eyes to see you leading us. In the name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Let's listen for God's word in our readings this morning. From Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians in chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. There is no need to write to you, friends, 
about the times and occasions when these things will happen. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come as a thief comes at night. When people say everything is quiet and safe, then suddenly destruction will hit them. It will come as suddenly as the pains that come upon a woman in labour, and people will not escape. But you, friends, are not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, we should not be sleeping like the others. We should be awake and sober. It is at night when people sleep. It is at night when they get drunk. But we belong to the day and we should be sober. We must wear faith and love as a breastplate and our hope of salvation as a helmet. God did not choose us to suffer his anger, but to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us in order that we might live together with him, whether we are alive or dead when he comes. And so encourage one another and help one another, just as you are doing now. And from Matthew's Gospel, we read in verse chapter 25, beginning at verse 14. Matthew chapter 25 at verse 14. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like this, said Jesus. Once there was a man who was about to leave home on a trip. He called his servants and put them in charge of his property. He gave to each one according to his ability. To one he gave five thousand gold coins, to another he gave two thousand, and to another he gave one thousand. Then he left on his trip. The servant who had received five thousand coins went at once and invested his money and earned another five thousand. In the same way the servant who had received two thousand coins earned another two thousand. But the servant who had received one thousand coins went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came back and settled accounts with them. The servant who had received five thousand coins came in and handed over the other five thousand. You gave me five thousand coins, sir, he said. Look, here are another five thousand that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant, who had been given two thousand coins, came in and said, You gave me two thousand coins, sir. Look, here are another two thousand that I have earned. Well done, you good and faithful servant, said his master. You have been faithful in managing small amounts, so I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come on in and share my happiness. Then the servant who had received 1,000 coins came in and said, Sir, I know that you are a hard man. You reap harvests where you did not plant and you gather crops where you did not scatter seed. I was afraid, so I went off and hid your money in the ground. Look, here is what belongs to you. You bad and lazy servant, his master said. You knew, did you, that I reap harvests where I did not plant and gather crops where I did not scatter seed? Well then, you should have deposited my money in the bank and I would have received it all back with interest when I returned. Now, take the money away from him and give it to the one who has 10,000 coins. For to every person who has something, even more will be given and he will have more than enough. But the person who has nothing, even the little that he has, will be taken away from him. As for this useless servant, throw him outside in the darkness. There he will cry and gnash his teeth. Amen. May God bless this reading from his holy word. To his name be praise and glory. Now we're going to pause for some music. Every time. 
did not choose us to suffer his anger, but to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us in order that we might live together with him, whether we are alive or dead, when he comes. Today's parable told by Jesus is often told as if it's some kind of pattern for stewardship in the church. But that is a total misinterpretation of the meaning of this passage. We should not stop reading, really, at the end of verse 30, because this parable belongs in a pair with the next part of the parable. The reading in the next part of the chapter, and these words that we will consider next week. But perhaps you might like to keep them in mind this week too. For the parable of the talents tells us about the world as it is, and the following verses from 31 to 46 tell us about God and the kingdom of God as it is. The two readings depend on each other to inform us how the world is and how God's kingdom is. But today we only have half of the reading. Jesus begins where we are now. In the first part of the chapter, he tells a very worldly story. A man with servants is going on a journey, and so he entrusts each of his servants with a large amount of money. He's obviously rich and wants his riches to increase, so he instructs them to take the money and go and make more money, not for themselves, but for him. He is effectively employing them on a zero-hours contract, and they have to work as long as it takes to make him a profit on his investment. And two of them set off with zeal for their task and succeed in doubling his investment. And when he comes back, the master was greatly pleased. He promoted these valuable assets into happiness. However, his third servant did not approve of his boss's business practices, and he did not join in with them. He did not even put the boss's money in the bank. Instead, he treated it as if it were dead to him and he buried it in the ground. He returned to the master exactly what he was given, no more and no less. The master was furious with this criticism. And so he threw the servant out, taking what he had given him and giving it instead to the one who had made the most money. Free from the blessing of his master's happiness, was the servant gnashing his teeth as the master expected? I don't think so. He was not a good servant, but that did not make him a bad person. His criticism of his master showed that his wisdom was not that of the world. Instead, this servant was a citizen of heaven, not the denizen of hell. It does us good to remember that what God sees as a return for his investment in us is nothing to do with how much money we raise, even if we're trying to raise it with hats. Raising finances is about the church. Raising the kingdom of God is our real service. Of course, money helps the church to serve God, for it finances the charitable activities that help us to encourage our neighbours. But it should never be about raising more and more money to enrich one person or one congregation or one organisation. It is only in the second part of the teaching next week that we will find out exactly what God wants and how God will judge his servants. And it's very different from the judgment of the worldly ma master in this week's readings. Just as God's servants must not work for profit but for the establishment of God's kingdom on earth, where the sort of business practices of the first part of the teaching are entirely inappropriate. Money itself is not good or evil. It's neutral in this world. It's how money is used that shows up both good and evil, generosity and greed. Those who point out the wrongdoings of power established on the acquisition of more and more profit accrued to those who are already rich are likely to be cast out of the party, like the so-called useless servant. But he had already detached himself by refusing to play the game that rewarded the others. 
He was the strongest willed and strongest minded in the story, and the bravest by far, because he refused to play where he did not agree with the rules. He is our model of kingdom behaviour in the world of economics. If we want things to change upon the earth, many more of us must also walk out of the game and be happy with enough and have no need to possess more than we actually need. More than any other parable, this one points out the difference between our world and the kingdom of God. In this world, even those who play the game, who serve the cause, who follow the rules of business, are subject to the judgments of the Darwinian boss, respected only for his devotion to profit. For the moment they are rewarded and promoted. But what happens when the profits begin to fall? Their service is only valued when it brings in more money, when it is productive in the world's terms. The boss feels no compunction to look after his servants. Even his management style is totally hands-off. He didn't care how the money was made as long as it was made. We should never have been taught to equate this master with God in any way, for God's part is yet to be shown in this reading. The parable describes how the world is for so many people, a struggle to justify their existence through the making of economic profit and sense to their employers. And yet, for so much of human history, the servant had no choice in their service. People were born into households or had to go into service young due to their family's economic circumstances. Masters were served, some from fear and some in love, depending on their attitudes and their treatments of those who served. Generous masters had happy servants. Ungenerous masters were often a grave danger to their servants. And most of us are very glad that our lives are now different. But how different are they really? Our economy divides rich from poor, employed from unemployed, hopeful from despairing. Generations of underemployment have created an underclass who can never get their heads above the water financially because the jobs that they might have done are gone. Nothing works for them and they cannot work in jobs that require new training and skills that they are not equipped for. They are cast out of the light of economic gain into the darkness of constant struggle for money to live on. They are looked down on those by, by they are looked down on by those who are useful to our current economy and despised by those who have employable talents and opportunities as lazy. Before COVID, there were already far too many people unemployed or working on zero hours contracts, day to day and even hour to hour employment, unable to save, unable to plan, going to food banks to feed their children even though they were working and working hard. There was another reading this morning though, a reading that warns us of the ending of all these things. The Apostle Paul writing to the young church in Thessalonica makes the point that everything the world thinks is solid is actually subject to immediate change. That the time of the final judgment will come and it will not be the absentee profiteer who will make the judgment. It will be the Lord who sees all that we do, all the things we live through and who is not swayed by how important we are in this world's terms. Paul says it will be when everything seems to be rolling on safely in the world's terms that everything will change. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And even though in our times the rich are always looking for thieves in the night, no one will see this one coming. Time will run out for the world's way. And this should come as no surprise to folk of faith, to those who hold the line for the kingdom of heaven, for justice, peace and equality, for the things that cannot be bought and paid for or hoarded. We should not sleepwalk into the great change, 
Instead, our eyes should be open and watching for it. Human beings have a great talent for assuming the way things are is how they are always meant to be, that the status quo cannot be shifted. God, however, can cause a cataclysm of change to happen immediately, to upset the way things are, to allow the kingdom to actually be, and it could happen at any time. We fall into a doze like last week's wise and foolish girls waiting for the change. But we should be active participants in the change that is coming. We are not to assume that what is, is all that there shall be. We are not to give up the hope of preparation. If we live as servants of God, we live as if the kingdom of heaven is here already, for it is in our hearts when we allow it to grow there. We are the servants of God, not of the absentee profiteer master. We have the armour. We can wear faith and love as a breastplate. We can have the helmet of hope because God did not choose us to suffer his anger, but to possess salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. God is not coming back to throw us out into the darkness, but to take his servants into the kingdom of light. So Paul tells us that we are to encourage one another and to help one another as we serve the kingdom. We're not competing in the world's terms, but should focus instead on serving God and one another in determination to follow our Lord Jesus Christ and to see the glorious reversal of God's way of doing things revealed in these stories Jesus told to teach us. Thanks be to God for all that he shows us in our lifetime. Amen. Now we're going to sing together hymn number 253, Inspired by Love and Anger. Informed of God's own body. 
Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, yours is the light we follow. Yours is the service we look up to. Service in love that spoke the truth to the powerful and powerless alike. Words that laid bare the problems and illuminated the truth in ways that could not be ignored. Forgive us, Lord, that we have misunderstood, that we have collaborated with the way things are when we should have reached for your kingdom in all ways. Forgive us for towing the line, when we should have been charting the way ahead. Forgive us for falling asleep in the darkness, instead of lighting the lamp of faith. We pray for your people throughout the whole world, each facing up to different challenges, each sharing the same concerns for your will to be done on earth. Bless all service given in love, Bless all dreaming done in faith. Bless all possibilities uncovered in truth-telling. In our divided world, may we bridge the gaps and remind everyone that we are your children together. We pray for those whose service takes them into the danger of disease, danger of injury, danger of exhaustion and extinction. We pray for those who are held in the stillness of grief and sorrow and pray that you will set their feet upon the path to move forward towards light. We pray for those who are so worried about everything that they have forgotten that there is still serving and hoping and believing to do until your kingdom comes. We thank you for the astonishing news of working vaccines and we hold up to you our prayers for all who are working on them and the others in preparation and for those who are making plans to distribute it. And we pray that that vaccine may be distributed fairly across this world of need. We pray for those we love and for those whom we struggle to love. We pray for those we know who need your help. As we wait in hope for the coming of your kingdom, help us to stay awake and aware of all that's happening so that we may see where you are working and join in with faith and delight so that we will be ready for the day and the hour and not found asleep. All this we pray in your holy name, as we say together the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Now be at peace in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, wherever you are. Move at the behest of his spirit and serve our creator with a song in your heart and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and for evermore. Amen.